Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integrated Rhythm, two swing dancing besties. That's Chisomo Salamani and myself, Bobby White, exploring race and other topics in swing dancing and the swing music scene. Today we have with us Ursula Hicks. Ursula Hicks from Texas. She is a very, very, very well-trained dancer from other walks of life. And she is a full-time swing dance instructor. And so I actually just got to teach with Ursula for a week in Harang, and it was amazing. I was so honored. Ursula asked me to be her fellow instructor. We did Balboa and Lindy Hop for a week, and I, it was like we had, it's like we had been teaching for years. Like We just went right in and just bam, 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 fantastic, really comfortable teaching, and I so value her values so much. And you know you meet someone special when you all both want to say change partners at the same time. That's, that's a true mark of like, teacher like compatibility right there so uh ursula is going to talk to us today about lindy hop clothing honky tonking contact improvisation and what she would add to the world of lindy hop teaching and which i've seen firsthand and i think it's going to be fantastic so here we go Really quick, we want to get a huge, huge, huge thanks to our Patreon patrons, which we have listed all in the episode thingy below. So check that out. You can see if you see someone who you know, maybe give them a personal thanks the next time that you see them. Being a patron, we cannot thank you enough. We and we really appreciate your patience. I know this last year and a half has been a little slow on the episodes, but please know that your contributions have allowed us to pay for a chunk of what we've done already uh, every episode of integrated rhythm takes about six to eight ep- hours of, of work to get it as good as it is and it could be a lot better but of course that would take twice three times as much time uh, which we just don't have the the resources for um, so patrons we appreciate so much your contributions they have helped and even though you don't see as many episodes recently they are they are doing good work and helping us pay for what's already been made and so we cannot thank you enough thank you thank you thank you thank you let's get to ursula hicks Bobby. I don't know if you notice anything different about Chisomo, but she Uh-oh. doesn't have horns behind her head anymore, which was the back <laughs> of the bookcase that was back in the background. <laughs> that used to be a theater game we used to play. It's like you had to remove things or change things about your appearance and like actually try to remember. I was like, I don't know how this relates to theater, but I was like, oh, I didn't pay attention to her background. My bad. I was just looking at her beautiful face, you know? <laughs> Interesting. Cool. I um, that theater game. I know. We played other things, but I had this one theater teacher, and she was like, yeah, so, like, remove, like, either, like, take off your glasses, or you might undo a button and stuff. So I don't know if it was our observation purposes. I was like, I don't know what this does, but maybe some theater teacher out in the world could let me know, because that was one thing I didn't understand, but... It was fun. That is a that's a good question to ask the people. Have you ever played that theater game where you had to change one thing about your parents, and then also, what's the purpose? Yeah, <laughs> like pedagogically, what is the purpose of this thing? <laughs> that would have been that'd be a really neat thing, to, especially to have done in high school, especially to like remind remind people how much like what they are is can be what they wear. You know, like. Like, hey, okay, tomorrow come dress as the opposite of your personality and, you know, do that and see, see what that's like. See how people treat you. See how see how you act differently because of what you're wearing and stuff. Oh, yeah. wow. oh I love a good social experiment with clothes. I mean, we all kind of do that, though, don't we sometimes? Like, I, I know I'll like, I want, I'll try on that pair of sunglasses I've never tried on before. Then you put it on, you're like, whoa, I'm different now. I'm, <laughs> I'm a different person. And so, I kind of like it. I'm kind of scared, but I kind of like it. So that's one. Okay. So random thing about me is I think of the most random stuff, like anything you say might trigger like random memories. So that reminds me of being with my siblings because they're much older than me and then watching like an episode of Maury. And <laughs> they were talking about these like beautiful women who manipulate men and it's just all this craziness. And they're like, we're going to put it to the test. 
is it really about their looks or are they really convincing? So they like put all this like makeup on them to make them look really drab and ugly. And they had to like make them like do some, like guys, just random guys do tasks on the street. So, you know, it's probably all just like fixed and stuff, but it's just an interesting social experiment. Like they made them look ugly and they just basically took off their makeup. <laughs> they were like, I uh, made them do like make random dudes on the street like oh can you like hold this mirror for me or can you do this task for me because it's like oh they really are attractive beyond their like makeup and I'm like but this is like my six-year-old brain trying to remember what's happening but it was just like I've seen so many like talk shows do that like Maury other than you are not the father it's like let's do so <laughs> <laughs> I, well, so one of the things that's like kind of disturbing about this is that we do, we know like people treat people differently based on appearance, but to quote Stephanie and some of the research she's done, like looking at attractiveness studies, basically all that's needed to be considered attractive is basic hygiene. So because attractiveness is so subjective, like we know like symmetry and stuff, but like, um, so it's like, a good thing, but then also kind of like a, you know, a weird thing. I don't know. But. Define hygiene. Because, <laughs> you know, like, you know, there, there's that phase, you know, like Matthew McConaughey will sometimes go through a phase where he's got like scrubby beard all over Ooh. his face and it's like, head's like, it's kind of gl- greasy back and all this kind oh, of stuff. That's interesting. And he's that's like, is he still Matthew McConaughey? Right. There's a difference between grooming and hygiene, though. Like, ones, I feel like, hmm. Because for me, hygiene is like, are you clean or not? Like, overall, versus, like, grooming, like, how your appearance is. Like, mm-hmm. if I groom my hair to be a certain way, it can be any other way, as long as I'm washing it. You know, I don't know. Like, you got to kind of maybe smell good. And well, actually, that's me. That's step one. Smell speaking like of that. Matthew McConaughey... He apparently, <laughs> according to the news, he hasn't worn deodorant in 37 years. I know, for you know, like my Google news feed has like learned some weird things that I'll click on, and like Matthew McConaughey, I'll click on him occasionally. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now it tells me when now it tells me when when the McConaughey is up to anything. And so he apparently he hasn't worn deodorant in 37 years. Is his natural mud, like if he hasn't like just played a game of basketball and, and stinking to high hell, if he just like, you know, woke up on a relatively cool mattress and like snuggled with you, would his general smell be like, okay. That, like, is there a musk of the natural smell that would mean that Matt McConaughey doesn't have to put on deodorant if he's, if, he, if his just general aura of smell is, is, is pleasing? That could be a good poll at UT Austin where he was like a teacher and you like Oh right. Yeah, right Texas. Professor. Yeah, yeah, he's huge in Texas. <laughs> How are office hours with Matthew? McConaughey? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's that that could be done. UT Austin, my peeps. Well, I didn't go to UT Austin, but still. You live nasty to all right, all right, all right. Where does Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> Where's the scale? <laughs> <laughs> is that three all rights or two all rights? <laughs> yes, man. I heard he's good people, so that helps, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. So if he, okay, so yeah, okay. So if he's a relatively really nice guy and a, and a fun guy to be with, and if his like general smell is fine. And if he's got like scruffy beard face. And so basically, if he's operating on low levels of hygiene and like a very specific shabby grooming style and just a generally good personality and Matthew McConaughey bone structure. They'll go, wow, what a good hit. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, Bobby has thrown a very interesting question into the mix. One that I think I need to like ponder on for a second. Well, I will say, so So this kind of reminds me, bringing this to the swing scene, <laughs> by a little bit of a stretch. So I, I, did a, I did a post on dancing etiquette like 10 years ago on Swung Over. And for the most part, like it was all kind of generic stuff. Like if you kick somebody, you know, just acknowledge it and, and give up, apologize, you know, you know, make sure you know, accept no gracefully, those kind of all basic kind of stuff. And the thing that got, the thing that got a lot of like, 
criticism slash opposite opinion slash like that really raised a lot of interesting questions is I had something in there about, you know, like sweating and like, I was like, you know, good hygiene, change your shirt if it's sweat through all that kind of stuff. I put on those basic things and there was some pretty big pushback from people about like sweats natural. Sometimes it's part of the experience, part of the moment, like you're, you're out there to experience a thing. You're not out there to like, you know, keep changing shirts all night or I don't know. It was really interesting. And I was, and I, I had to give them credit that like, actually, yeah, there's some scenes out there and there's some dancers out there that they don't mind sweat. They don't mind dancing in sweat and they don't mind touching sweat. And I know that's, that might be a minority, but it was a, it was a vocal one. Mm. Yeah. I have memories of the first time, like my first time going swing dancing. And there was this guy in the Dallas area and he had like long hair, which is cool. And it was always in a ponytail, but some magical way, like it turned into like this rat tail type of situation. Mm. And like magically, whether he spun or if we spun or he did something with his head, like it would like hit your arm. Oh, the and, slap. Like, stick. And you're like, the ponytail slap. Oh. And how did it stick? I can't explain the science, but it was like, it's just weird, you know? Yeah, and you're just, like, no, that's, hair that's rough. It's stuck on me, you know? Yeah, that's rough. But it, and then you're like, okay, now I know the person. It's not as gross, but it's still kind of gross. It's like, yeah, might need to do something about that. Put it in a bun. Man buns were not cool yet. So it was just all the ponytail. So, but his hair would like stick on you. And it was just <laughs> that, that, that sounds not good. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there are like a couple different themes in here. Like I appreciate the thinking about the idea of shaming. So like, we don't want to shame people. Mm -hmm. There are also different understandings of, and this is Bobby, why I love the question. And I'd have to think about it. There's different understanding of what hygiene is. And so there's also like, I know that right now, amongst celebrities, there's conversations about like washing and, <laughs> and like what happens in many black homes versus what happens in many white homes and the frequency of washing and so and how to wash you know <laughs> and so there's like there's mm -hmm. cultural differences and all of that so I've, I've appreciated watching Ursula's facial responses to some of these questions because I think she and I are kind of on par with some of our stuff but that's also just because like full disclosure I come from Zambia where many people like traditionally like my mom is this way will bathe in the morning and in the evening. Like they bathe twice a day. I'm I'm a once a day bather, but like, it's just, there's just the sense of, and, and when I say that, I mean, I'm talking about like, dove expo, like exfoli exfoliation, soap, is shampoo All of the things. once a day? Or are you like an every I now and then? Shampoo once a day because- Shampoo might be like once in a few days. Yeah, like so when my when I have my natural hair, it is like more frequent. But I have kind of entirely outsourced my hair care to a professional. <laughs> so that's, no. that was one of those adult decisions where I was like, I'm just gonna I can afford this, so you're just gonna deal with that. But but everything else below the scalp is yeah. So I was going to say, I think that was interesting what you said about that, about culturally, just somewhat, because before I was, we broke up is I have a, my best friend in the whole wide world named Katie. She has like completely different hair. Like she has red hair, goes past her butt, like the longest, thickest hair does not hold a curl. And I remember one time sleeping at her, like sleepover at her house. And she was asking me some questions about her hair. She's like, Hey, does my hair look okay today? I was like, yeah, it's glossy, like it's, it's cute, like it's glossy. She's like, no girl, it's oily and I haven't washed it in a couple of days. This is what my hair looks like when it hasn't been washed. I was like, now I know, now I know what to tell you. But then even like spending the night at her house and like doing what we call a twist out. So like twisting my hair all over so it like defines the curls. And so she'd be like, wait, how's your hair staying like that? I'm like, I just twist it up. She's like, you don't need any rubber bands. I'm like, no, my hair curls. So it curls around itself. It stays in place. And then I would do my hair. I'm like, does this look right? She's like, it's, it's poofier than normal. Or it looks like this. And I'm like, it ain't supposed to look like this. This is not what I want my hair to look like. So it's been interesting <laughs> even growing up for me to be like, yeah, your hair looks a little oily. Like knowing what that means now, like 
how her hair produces oils all the time and how frequently she has to wash it versus me. I'm like, this shape doesn't look good or I don't have to wash it as nor or as often, depending on how sweaty I am. Like if we're taking dance classes, then it's like, okay, yeah, I would wash it more often. But then other than that, like kind of showing her, yeah, this doesn't look as good, does it? She's like, nah, it doesn't look good. So <laughs> it's kind of cool, like educating each other growing up about our hair and the hygiene even. She yeah. would always ask questions about that. So yeah, cool. that is really cool. I so my my best friend is also she's also white and she is she and I have had similar kinds of conversations, but I still don't I still don't understand the difference between like a couple of days oily and not like I you know, Bobby, you were talking about your your natural hair product and I, I'm like, it looks great. Like that's I I'm not I, my eyes with that are not like the best. So that's something where I realized mm -hmm. interculturally we don't have we don't always have the tools to dissect what's going on on the other side, right? And so in the same way that I can see people like when my hair is like I've had braids in for a little bit you know, and I'm like, ooh, I cannot wait to see Shaquana. I've had people <laughs> like, what's go what's wrong? Like, what's different? And I'm like, do you see all this hair that you can see here? All that? That's not that's not the way I want it to look. And they're like, oh, but it looks fine. And I'm like, well, it's not. It, it's that's. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, same thing. <laughs> like, it's just like we have a hard time sometimes seeing what you know, right. Right. Yeah. And I want somebody to explain dry shampoo to me one day. Like dry shampoo. What I, about I think, it? Huh? What is it? <laughs> it's cor it's usually cornstarch that is oh. put into some aerosoler. You can actually you can literally just use cornstarch if you want to. I've I've done that in the past. Wow. Just a handful of cornstarch, rub it in, and basically the cornstarch takes all the oil out. I was about to say so it absorbs it. Huh. That's and then cool. somehow I don't don't ask me where the cornstarch goes once it's absorbed <laughs> all the oil. <laughs> that is a mystery that no one can answer. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Because it's like it's a magical thing that I see that people love, and I go, I don't, I don't have the same issue, so I don't know. I've never had to buy it or use it, so it's just always fascinated me the idea. Yeah, it's great. Like especially like when I would when I would be at Lindy. Focus, for instance, and I knew that each night as an MC, I would have to have product in my hair, and I didn't want the next day to be like a horrible situation. Then you just dry shampoo the crap out of it, or I would just take handfuls of cornstarch and <laughs> shuffle it in my hair, uh, and then you'd have like a relatively nice dry hair that's ready to go for the next night's nice thing without having to rewash, especially because rewashing gets your hair super clean. with that great luster, but then it's so. Mm -hmm. poofy and and hard to manage for me right right yeah i relate to that just like a couple of days old like hairstyles and stuff and like how to refresh without having to like make it squeaky clean just because yeah. it's harder to do huh that's cool thanks for yeah. me yeah well, <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. shampoo takes so much out right like that's the thing is it like strips your hair and so even it's cleaning things but it doesn't leave your hair in the best space to be styled so yeah that makes total sense i had so i have a psoriasis and occasionally my scalp itches and when my scalp itches i have this prescription shampoo that i use and it is incredible this prescription shampoo is like the best shampoo I've ever used in my, like it just leaves my hair perfect, exactly the way I would want it to after shampoo, right? And then I've been getting Instagram on pros. Do y'all know pros? The like customized hair treatment. Well, if you go look, if you go just Google pros, you will start getting the Instagram ads and then you will understand like this Instagram ad was again, incredible. This is another incredible hair Instagram ad where like this, guy with majestic hair is like using their products. And he's like, first I use the, the pre moistened shampoo scalp. Then I use the post shampoo wave conditioner. Then I like, so he goes through like three products and, and when it's done, his hair is, is a uni, it's unicorn hair. It's just flowing, <laughs> beautiful, thick, luscious. And that is one of the few times in my life where I was like, 
all right, this person modeling this has convinced me to at least give it a try. And so I got, I got, I, I, it's a 44 questionnaire, 44 questions that you type in about your hair and all the things that you do with your hair and all this kind of stuff. And then sure enough, they sent me a customized, it has my, <laughs> the box has my name on it. <laughs> it's like a cardboard <laughs> box that has your name on it. And you open it up and it's like, it has like really nice stationary cards for directions that like, this is your conditioner. This is your shampoo. This is your wave identifier or whatever. And, and it, and like there's a bunch of numbers on it and those numbers are the amount of whatever ingredient they put in there in order to like customize it specifically for your hair. And I did it and it was fine, but it wasn't as good as my like prescription. <laughs> <laughs> the good stuff. Yeah. The good stuff. Oh no. I love like all Psoriasis of prescription shampoo. That's my secret. Dang. <laughs> Do you have psoriasis? <laughs> well, isn't there a poo for you? Like, <laughs> poo for you. Okay, so you got to lie about having psoriasis to your dermatologist, and he'll give you a subscription, a prescription. Done it. I mean, we'll do it. <laughs> psoriasis, psoriasis poo for that do. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's on a poster somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have beautiful hair. That's so funny. Oh man, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation about hair. <laughs> I will say, listening to the other episodes that people have done talking about their hair, I go, ooh, yep, ooh, yep, I understand, ooh, yeah. Because it's the hardest thing going to dance events trying to figure out your hair. So this, I'm like, let's just chop it off because it's hot and then start over because it's, it's a hard life. And then also talking about hygiene, like I find myself packing more undergarments than any other trip when I go to dance events just because I'm like I do try to like shower somewhat in between stuff you know like classes and events or like for competing versus like the night dance I don't know like my yeah. I don't know how to park like pack smart anymore no I think you're like I have many pairs of underwear specifically because I'm a dancer and so like when I go away there's a big stack that goes in there to make sure uh -huh. you're always so fresh and so clean right I mean, it's like three days, you have nine pairs. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to talk Especially like with, like, I remember for Beantown, well, any camp that I have, I'm taking lessons and I'm also rehearsing because of performances. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I have a pair to like go to class. And then I have a pair for rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> for the competition and like the first part of the evening dance <laughs> you know? right. like, so for each because like you sweat so much in each section mm -hmm. like i've yeah. had you know, it's i i hear you and and then when you think like as you're talking about hygiene like thinking about hair thinking about makeup and other things like I know that there have been times when I've forgotten items and that has been like the worst thing ever because if you don't have somebody who is either like similarly complected or mm -hmm. understands what's going on with your hair or is around your same body size like depending on the item then it's like your that could make or break your experience right so yeah yeah and I mean, I definitely relate to the body type thing. And this is something I've talked to Dee about is just like body types and dancing. Cause I am, I am a career dancer. And so like, it is one of those things, like I double check, like all those things. Like when I go to like some of the events and they're like, look at these vintage clothes. I go, I ah, know that's not going to be my section. Let me just <laughs> check out these other boots over here. Shoes, jewelry, I got you. But sometimes like that is a thing, like, it helps me budget. Definitely. I'm like, I know I'm not going to spend money on this, but, but inclusivity, not only of like hairstyles and stuff, but sometimes like our, our shape a little bit like that is a make or break for me sometimes like going to events and like experiencing the full idea of it, you know, unless it's like a custom made something or another that I'll need a sugar daddy to pay for. But you know, like that's the work in progress too. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I think, I think that's interesting. And a lot of that, and I, even for me, at least personally, like I don't wear that much makeup hardly ever unless I perform, but it's just one of those, like, it's just doesn't feel good to sweat through. It's just like a lot of, 
stuff on my face. And then I'm always afraid of like getting it on a guy's shirt. Like we're like in close embrace and I'm like, oop, that's lipstick on your shirt. Sorry. Or oops, that's some darker <laughs> foundation on your nice clean white shirt. <laughs> and I go, sorry. So the struggle's real. I definitely have learned to hug people like this. Like, <laughs> like with my face. Or I might make a comment, like it might be like, I have a whole lot of makeup on. I like sorry. But but in Balboa in particular, like You'll, if you look over, mm -hmm. you see on leader, like leaders left, right? Yeah, on their. Usually, on, on my, usually it's on the right side of right side, my yes. jacket. Yes, sorry. I, right, yeah. Follower bias. Yeah, yeah. On, on the leader's right side, you'll just see like a mark. <laughs> you'll see lipstick marks. You're like, yeah. oh, <laughs> Annabelle's wearing pink lipstick today. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> What a way to color match, just watch. But like, guys, ooh, that's a nice color. <laughs> Who was wearing that one? <laughs> yeah, and so. Yeah, it's, it's almost almost all of my coats have lipstick. I don't even, I don't even worry about getting them off anymore. And a lot, like, uh, sometimes sometimes the dancers are like, oh, I'm so sorry, I got lipstick on your nice coat. It's like, won't be the first, won't be the last. No, I'm um, often, yeah. I've actually heard some followers say in lessons, like, Bow's a close embrace dance. So, like, followers, if you get lipstick on his coat, you know you're doing something right. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know you're not running away from the connection. But, yeah. But I I hear you. I, I endeavor not to ruin my friend's clothes. So, yeah. But I actually wanted to ask about competitions and, and clothing. Because, like, I've known, or, or, or even performances in clothing. Because I know that when I've been at a camp and you know oftentimes like choreographies will come together when you're away at the camp and so then it's like what do you have in your bag of tricks you know like and so when you're creating right. your outfit that way that's fine because you're clothing yourself but like i've struggled sometimes when people are like I, we we're gonna wear these like high-waisted skirts <laughs> you know and then it's like okay that that line might work for you, but that's not gonna. That's not gonna work for me, friends. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I have witnessed. I'm thankful to be of the dance generation, where like I look at my my coworkers and like my mentors of like swing here locally, and like when they would compete, like everybody to the team was dressed the same way, and I think to myself all the time, like. There's no way I could have pulled that off. So I love that it's kind of changed into like the color scheme. Like we're going to go for pastels. We're going to go for these colors and good luck, you know, because it's like, it's nice to kind of see like, oh, like team, like team performances now, even at a competition level is like wearing more of the color palettes, you know, versus always like to the T, like the same shapes because it doesn't work for everyone. I think. That just takes like some smarts of whoever you're working with, you know, like those realities to just be aware of those things. Because I know for me, I remember being on the team, they're like, let's wear like these tights and these things and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. And then it might hit a certain extreme where it's just like, well, can we just all wear the same hair accessory and call it a day? And then everything else would be like, I can put a flower in my hair. That's pretty easy. But like to wear like the citrus on sometimes like certain high waisted pants do not work with my waist and my hip ratio and my thighs, ooh, thunder thighs, like the thighs are the things that get in the way the most. But it's nice to kind of see like people are like, let's pick these palettes or like these primary colors or like solid colors. So at least like sometimes packing those things help a lot or just having a conversation about it before you arrive because a lot of planning has to go in for sure. Yeah, I've, yes, like, clothing for me has been like that's usually the thing I'm nervous the most nervous about is like yeah because I'm also not a fan of wearing of the pants situation the trouser situation trying to make that whole thing work because similar right so if you have stuff like if you're not cut in a traditional way quote unquote pants don't work for you like it's pants were not made for women they weren't I mean <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a it definitely is a struggle. But even like locally doing gigs, like a lot of gigs like we get are like 1920s Gatsby themed stuff. And yeah. so there have been like times where it's like 
luckily the people are remaking a lot of the outfits or costumes into extended sizes. But it sometimes it's like it doesn't look the same because the whole idea of the drop waist is to like make you look like you ain't got no waist, right? And so for me, it's just like, oh, here's almost an hourglass in a drop waist, you know, type of situation. So it it is it's interesting. Like overall, it's like okay, like if you find the right size and you find like the right cut, it works. But that's also something that's like that I experience and I realize like can be a slight insecurity even for me is just like seeing friends who are smaller and it's like oh yeah that's going to fit them the way it's supposed to look because of the style of the era right but sometimes with me i'm like is this gig 40s because at least they start curving out some stuff you know like things shape out a little bit more depending on like what route you're going but yeah that's something i've even seen like when i see pictures and you go oh that doesn't look like a straight line <laughs> that's kind of like a oh cool it wants to be a, a something else it wants to be an hourglass it wants to be something else but and the 1920s had that really weird thing anyway, where they wanted the women to look like prepubescent boys, right? Yeah. And, which is, you know, that's that's not necessarily what you want to go for. That's got some issues, right? That's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah, and it's 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 hard when like we're talking about like body structures that are a particular way, and like I and I should say I shouldn't say that the clothes items themselves weren't made for a particular gender. I should say that the clothing companies are not accommodating for what people are trying to go for. Because like, like let's have a conversation about like people who are looking to wear, like, for instance, I'm going to call out Jessica. Like Jessica looks really great and loves vintage, vintage menswear and looks amazing in it. Right. We should be able to wear those things, but clothing companies don't always aren't always thoughtful in how they craft things. And so, one of my friends is a fashion designer, and as she, as she's a fashion designer, particularly in Africa, and she talks about the African mm-hmm. woman's body. She's like, you can have a waist that's a size ten, you can have hips and thighs that are a size sixteen, and a top that's a size eight. Like how she's like that, and and we're clothing those women because that's what women's bodies are but like companies in mass production are not considering all of that so then if you do have many variations and are trying to like wear a variety of different things it's just the space isn't there for you right so you're like ah but it's not the clo- it's not you it's not your body that's at fault it's the clothes like the clothes aren't doing the thing that we need them to do and so right yeah, and I think that's why for me at least separates have been a a good thing. So like a skirt versus like the top and stuff. And I mean, this is just like basic ideas, like fashion ideas. I don't know, I'm not a fashionista, but like that's the thing I have to think about. Like what shape is gonna work on top versus the bottom. Like it's nice to be able to buy things in different sizes versus a set sometimes because like when I'm up top being like heavier chest you know, versus like maybe a smaller waist pre-COVID, what? But having a smaller waist and then getting down to the hips, it is different proportions. So like just kind of being aware of certain shapes and stuff. And even when I shop with friends, it's just like, oh, you look cute in that. I'm like, that's cute. But let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this right here and create the same illusion, you know. Um, but then at the same time, it's kind of cool. Like aside from the vintage stuff, I'm really happy with like where clothing is in the sense of our age of just like the high waist stuff. Because I'm like, can pull off a crop top without having to show my belly button because it's like oh I can hide this gut and then show this part so like there are definitely ways to luckily now like play with that kind of stuff but even on the venture side it's a matter of playing with the ideas or for me it's like I used to want to dive into more of the vintage stuff but now I'm like what's what what can I play with that is inspired by it like I could have a pencil skirt but it can be a very modern pencil skirt if I want to wear that or if I wear a high waist pant it's probably going to have elements that are more contemporary, right? And that's okay. And I think that's the thing is like the inspiration behind it and the spirit of a thing versus sometimes I'm just kind of over being able to fit any of that stuff. But but luckily, like I said, there's companies now that are starting to kind of, you know, cater towards all body types, but it's just like, I can just whip something together and be inspired by it. I don't have to be it per se. So... You say yeah. you're not a fashionista, but that is not true. Anyone who knows that you're <laughs> social media knows that you know how to put an outfit together. So the people on this call are very inspired in the fashion space. So 
it took a lot of learning about my body. Like that's the thing is even like, like I was saying, being a curvier dancer, I think it's like a, a bigger scope for me. Like growing up dancing, like I was always the base or the one that had to support the smaller girls, you know? And then I got to college and I learned, oh, I could fly. Like I can understand what my, like how to use my momentum or my body type to then share my weight with someone who is, you know, smaller than me like you know like even in weight or in size but it's just like me understanding my body a little bit more so like even in a sense of like weight sharing and stuff or how I move my body it's the same thing like shopping like you go through those weird you know I feel like I went through some weird spurts in my fashion but overall I'm just like oh okay let's keep it cool let's let's see what works up here what works down here like I used to be afraid of tucking in my shirts. Now all I do is tuck in my shirts because I realize that helps with my silhouette a little bit more. And then also not being afraid to just try things on. Like I'm not one to really shop online unless I know the brand, but A, I'm also instant gratification. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to buy it now off the rack. But it's also helpful for me to try things on because I can go, oh no, this is not going to work or it doesn't work with what I have at home. But yeah, just like learning about yourself, learning about your body a little bit more like that's that's part of the journey. And the same way with dancing kids, you learn about your body and how it moves. So it's important to know for sure. Which is a perfect segue into you. So we know that you are this amazing sweet dancer, but you also do other styles of dance. So could you tell us a little bit about your other dance training and how that intersects with your social dance Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So history of Ursula, Ursula started dancing when she was a wee Bobby actually at church. Like I was always that artsy kid and like trying to like follow along and like watch dance videos and stuff. So my mom took the hint and signed me up for dance classes. So I went to this little studio in Lancaster, Texas, which is like a suburb of Dallas. And I did like a basic combo ballet tap jazz class. And so it was like very much like, this is a shuffle, this is a this. And we would do like ballet stuff, but the classes were fairly short. So it was not like a big conservatory type studio. It was more, it was more like smaller based, like small town kind of thing. So I didn't grow up in the competition world or any of that, but I found my love of dance because of that studio. And when I became a teenager, money was kind of hard for us financially. So my the owner of the studio was like, well, would you like to start assisting with classes, like to kind of help with tuition and stuff? And I was like, yeah, of course. And so she's like, you're really good at this. Do you want to eventually teach? So like my junior or senior year, she gave me my first dance classes and I started with like little three-year-olds and stuff. So I started teaching dance. I was about 16, 17 years old, just by assisting. And then finally she gave me my own classes and stuff. So that kind of like encouraged me to keep going with dance. And then I went to Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas, which is just north of Dallas and got my BA in dance studies. So we were mostly like a contemporary modern based program. We had ballet classes. Thank God I graduated because you only need a level two of ballet. I'm just like, no, ballet is not my thing. Like, don't try to go through my Facebook looking at me as a ballet dancer. It's like (laughs) terrible at terrible feet. Didn't have strong ankles, and I honestly didn't work very hard in it. But modern, oh, that was my baby. You got to roll around on the floor a lot. You know, that was cool. And also, too, I remember, oh, yeah, I'm going to just feed off of Brandon a little bit, who you guys interviewed. He was talking a lot about, like, learning Horton and Leon style and stuff like that. We were more of what we call contact improvisational base. So uh, the idea of just, like, sharing weight a little bit more, like, it's more the best way to describe it is like it's more organic, you know, in a sense of like, let's roll on the floor and like, oh, this finger, just kidding. I'm not trying to knock it down, but it's a sense of just understanding our body weight and our shapes through space. And a lot of it is like, if you imagine like your center is drawing shapes through space. So like we have like technical terms like under curve and over curve, which is tends to transcend all modern dance. But that's the coolest thing is like when I watch contemporary dancers, we see them doing all this kinds of stuff, like they're really exaggerating, but I'm looking more at their center, like how they're drawing shapes through space, through their core. And so with that, because of that training, I was able to, what I like to say, fly more often, like being able to do partner work, being a curvier, heavier dancer, like finally being able to support my weight on someone else was like, 
the coolest thing for me. Just very happy. Like it was a school where it's not like you had to be this thick or this thin to like be even considered in the program or weighing, you know, weighing you every few weeks. Cause there's programs out there that'll do that for their ballet students. They have to like weigh them or they have to eat a certain diet. Cause it's like, it feeds into a company probably. And you know, you're not going to make it if you look this way, but you start smoking um, kid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so hard, but I'm very fortunate in the sense, like I was able to, to explore my sense of body weight and to like, partner do partner work with other people i think i got mostly in the way of me i feel like i could have had more potential in that but i got in the way of me because it's still i was still afraid but then too like like i said having friends who are smaller than me being able to like pick me up or to lift me and me assist with that because that's the thing with lifts and stuff of course we're assisting i think a lot of people when they see it they think oh they just pick them up and it's like no i gotta help you out so it was just really cool a lot of the imagery that they would give and a lot of the practices or what we would call jams that we would have that like once a week our teachers would facilitate and stuff. It was just really cool just to be able to like throw myself on someone and then them catch me. We were kind of talking about hygiene earlier. It got really sweaty and we're just like rolling in sweat. But, you know, it was just really it was really freeing for me to understand like I could a let go and then to like to be carried around for once. So like that was really a neat thing to experience in that realm. To this day, I still can't handstand though. The fact that I passed that, I have my degree and I couldn't handstand or cartwheel is a blessing. So <laughs> that's also cool. But it's, it's just interesting talking about the weight shifts and like how we create shapes through space with our bodies. And I think that's what gets me, like that's what I think I tend to gravitate to when I see work is like the shapes that are being composed in space. So yeah. That's really cool that your program, it sounds like they really, you know, they didn't try to push you into being something else. They let you be you. They let you, they kind of worked with you. Yeah, it's, yeah, because I think there's an element of that. And I mean, like, with wherever you go, there's like certain politics with that. I know currently the program, they, they're with this talk of just like, cultural awareness and like racial tensions and stuff. I know they've, they've also provided like the space for students to express also still grievances of like expectations of like, even within this program, I mean, every program is going to have a culture, but that doesn't mean there wasn't stressors of like, as a student, like I had to create dances that look this way because these types of works made concerts. Right. So though we didn't have like the competitiveness of like senior concerts versus faculty concerts, everybody was on the same playing field. So if a work was adjudicated, it was whether you were a professor or a grad student or undergrad, everybody was treated the same way. And they had like a specific adjudication committee that would decide like, if this work, like I remember even certain professors works didn't make a show, like if this other work was more complete, they were going to make this show before that show, you know, that professor. So that was kind of cool. But I know there's more conversations with like LGBTQ inclusion and like cultures and that. I know there's been talk about like people, who, whether they're Hispanic or African descent, like when they bring their culture, just like bring awareness to the professors of like how they critique work to make sure that it's not measured to what they deem as like, art that they appreciate, but to also kind of question like, but are you also taking the time to see my culture and to see what we're creating and like what you see as simplicity is actually a big part of my culture. And so I know there's been conversations on that front too, which I think is really good because so yeah, like not every program, there's not a perfect program out there, but at least there's some conversations that are starting, which is kind of cool to see my alma mater do, which encourages me a little bit and that there's like a lot of voices that are speaking up about like making sure that they're heard as they're being creative, you know? So it's really neat. How did that, when you started swing dancing, well, first of all, maybe tell us a little bit, a little bit about how you started swing dancing and then maybe like how the two roads crossed, how they didn't cross, like. Mm. Yeah. So the first time I was aware of swing dancing was when I was a dance student, maybe about, mm, 12 years old. 
And so one of my dance teachers at my old studio was actually a part of the swing dance community here in Dallas or back home in Dallas. And uh, so she was a part of this company called Acme Swing Company, which was part of the Dallas Swing Dance Society. <laughs> and she would teach adult swing classes at our studio. And we would look at her like, oh, that looks really cool. But we had to like go to ballet class. And so she finally told us like, hey, there's a place to go swing dancing. I was like, this is real? Okay, cool. So my 12 year old self was excited. And so my best friend's parents were taking the class. So we went swing dancing and I fell in love instantly. It was like, oh, this is so neat. This is so cool. The music is really cool. But then they're like, oh, we're okay. We're not in it. I was like, oh, dang y'all. And weirdly enough, I don't know if it's like this elsewhere, but for whatever reason, homeschoolers in Dallas love to swing dance. So I had a lot of friends that were homeschooled and they would go dancing together. And if they had a car, they would like, you know, carpool and go dancing. And I would ask my mom, like, hey, mom, could I go swing dancing with my friend? And she's like, there's no adults with you, then you can't go. So I didn't get to go, but all of like four times as a teenager. And then finally in college, there was a there's a Denton organization. So the Denton swing dance organization had dances and I found out that they were meeting and I was like, I want to go do this. I don't have a car, but I'm going to find dance majors who like to dance <laughs> and maybe want to try it. So, um, so we would carpool to the dance in Denton. I was like, Oh yeah, these are my people. I want to do it. And some of them are kind of like, I don't know, let's go back in country dance. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll go in country dance with you guys. So a good, like two years of college was like going to, to like the honky tonks in town. So going like to Billy Bob's in Fort Worth and staying out until 5 a.m. and all the dance majors having 8 a.m. classes the next day and falling asleep in class. But it was okay. We passed. <laughs> so like that was like a good chunk of just like doing country western dancing with friends. And then finally, as I was graduating and stuff, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try to go swing dancing more often just by myself. And then that's how I kind of got plugged in. Around 2013 is when I would say, like, officially I was starting to get plugged in. And then I would start carpooling back down to Dallas or going to Fort Worth and meeting other people. And then they were like, let's go to this dance event. I was like, the dance what? Cool, a dance event. So start carpooling with them and then meeting you cool people. And I'm just like, wow, this is a whole thing. So and then YouTube was, of course, a friend back then just to see, like, all the competition videos and be like, people do this? They do the flips too? Like, it just blew my brain. So it's really cool. And I finally was at a point where I was like, this is what jazz is supposed to be. Because growing up doing jazz, it was like pirouettes and leaps and, you know, things like that. Like to sweet dreams, you know, like to 80s music or 90s music, you know, like think Stephanie Tanner Full House. Like that's what I was doing. And then you're like, wait, this there's jazz music and there's a dance that goes to this. So that that made my heart feel happy. Like, oh, this is my pocket. I could get into this. So I mentioned you mentioned country western dancing. Uh-huh. And something that I like so I love to go out honky tonking. And uh-huh. just Shark Star has been out honky tonking with me on several <laughs> occasions. Or we, we have gone together to honky tonk. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think for our listeners, I think especially like in in some of the circles of the swing dance scene, they might say, oh, honky talking. So, OK, my kind of thing. But I would love to stress to you listeners out there, if your first thought when we were saying honky talking was like, I don't know, if I, uh, honky talking. In my experience. Honky tonking is like one of the last vestiges. It's one of the last places where especially people in white American culture go out, listen to live music, dance with other people, dance in line dances. That's one of the last places in white American culture where you go out and you party like the way that we do in the way that we try to do in in jazz dance. It's true. Yeah. And it's so funny. The line dance people, at least in Dallas, are intense. Like, if you don't know it, they're like, scram. Yeah. <laughs> get out of here. Like, get the hell off the dance yeah, floor. Yeah. They're like, nope. And it's so funny because I remember one, there's this place called, there's, it's called Cowboys, go figure. And they had a Dallas location called Red River. And so they would do like from eight o'clock to maybe nine o'clock before they would start like the two step stuff and the live music they would have just an hour of line dances and I would never thought in a million years you could spend an hour of your time just doing various line dances. And I remember we showed up one time and it's just like, 
okay, yeah, we're going to try to do it. And they give you like the meanest look. I was like, okay, it's your space. I'm so sorry. I was trying to pick it up. They're like, well, we have these classes. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Okay, great. I, I'll, I'll just wait till nine o'clock when they start the other stuff. But it's intense. It's so fun. It looks so cool though. And it looks so fun, but they're serious. And then they would leave. Like a lot of those line dance people were older. <laughs> so they're just like, okay, bye kids. You guys can now cut a rug you know around the floor i have so i have been to some where they're a little bit more friendly but i've definitely been to a few when they are intense as f just like you said yeah so good for them they found their thing <laughs> so but it's it's really interesting and i remember when we go country dancing we would go twice a week and we'd always try to find the places where it was ladies night because i went to a primarily female university anyway. So it's like, yeah, let's get in for free ladies night. And we would carpool with the neighboring, we had friends at the neighboring college at uh, University of North Texas. And so we would carpool to Fort Worth or carpool to Dallas and we would dance. And uh, it was so fun just because we would dance with each other. Looking back, I can't guarantee that we dance to the music, but it was just fun. Like just spend me 10 million times. That's cool. And then it's great. And then they're like, yeah, the dance majors know how to turn. We're like, we got your back. And then, <laughs> and then it would get into weird club music. And then I remember friends of ours would like create line dances. So we're like, yeah, come join us. Ha ha, line dancers, we have our own. <laughs> and then they would do like a balloon drop with cash in it. So we're like, ramen money, let's go. So it's like a whole night of awesomeness on ladies night like they would have these balloons that would drop from the ceiling and you would pop them to get like dollar bills or maybe you find a five dollar bill who knows and we would stay out until like 2 a.m when the bars closed and then if we would go out to ihop we were staying out until 5 a.m and dancing in the parking lot so like bobby said it's very similar to like what we might do with swing dancing but can we have those balloon drops that's what we think <laughs> that's the real question <laughs> can we have one dollar beer and balloon drops please yeah thanks Putting it out there. I'm looking at you, event organizers. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Ideas for event organizers. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we want to see post COVID. Yeah, post COVID. I need that dollar bill. I have that balloon. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. But I, I love the, uh, the one curiosity that you had, and then two, also just reflecting on the conversation that your dance department was and is having you know i know that a lot of academic departments are reflecting on how on like what what inclusion and belonging actually look like and mm -hmm. when we're talking about something that is so centered around someone's physical being there have been expectations about what dancers look like and we have that perception because it has literally been it's like described for us it's like a dancer has to be like this and then good dancing looks like this and so but when we are considering different cultures different ways to identify uh, that there needs to be space for that in, in artistic expression so I I really uh, those reflections I, I think are really salient to me and I'm, I'm looking forward to see more of what will happen with all of that and so yeah yeah yeah, and then to trail more into Bobby's question about like how that relates like between what I've learned there and with swing, I think that was like, which we've like definitely, I think, kind of teared away from is the idea of like heavy dancing. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was starting to dance, like that was kind of a term that was used a lot, like being a heavy follower and what that meant. Just because I'm like, well, I'm learning how to move my body in this, <laughs> this new thing, you know? Um, and I thought it was interesting when I started to dance, people were like, oh, you're a dancer. So you're going to pick this up just fine. You go, no, this is a new skill. Because like the concepts of partnering within the modern dance form that I was doing in school is completely different than partner work in swing. So I think that's one concept is like the idea of what is partner work in whatever genre of dance you're doing. So like with the contact improvisation thing, since it's a lot of shared weight, as I think is the best way to describe it, a lot of our 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 training and our talks were like about like pressing in to your partner, using momentum. I remember professors using 
terms like rolling points of contact. So like if this is like a partner's hand and this is a partner's hand, like being able to press in and roll through momentum and that might assist you into a lift versus like with Lendy Hop, there's a lead and there's a follow. So for me going from like pressing into my partner, being, you know, connected, like that word connection in that way versus connection here and waiting or whatever we like to say is the role of a leader and a follower and what that looks like doesn't matter but just it was it was definitely a r- different than what i was doing for the last three years you know three and a half years of study so like sometimes i think in a sense like dancers can probably pick up shapes we can pick up choreography and stuff but the that word connection that magical term <laughs> that we like to use sometimes like there's certain aspects of like when we learn different dance styles that we do have to adjust i remember when i was when I realized the term Lindy Hop for the first time and what that meant, well, not necessarily what it meant, but like the concept of a swing out, I didn't know what I was looking at. So like in my brain, I'm like trying to put on my movement analysis brain because that was the name of the class. Like how we analyze movement, right? How do we talk about movement? I just didn't know what I was looking at. Like I saw people doing cool stuff, but even if I were to watch any like Whitey's Lindy Hopper clips whenever I was trying to learn about this dance, I didn't know what I was looking at, you know, because it was just new for me. And so until I could see like, oh, this is what's happening, then my body, then I could finally start to embody it a little bit more. But it took me, it took me a minute to understand what was happening, you know, and to also realize I don't have to point my feet. Like just that alone, like I wasn't a ballet dancer, but I don't have to point my toes either. Every time my foot comes off the ground, that's cool. So (laughs) like that was the thing too. It was like, you know, it's your, you are having to, to adjust your body, you know, a little bit, you know, and then also to give ourselves grace, like when we see other swing dancers and their aesthetic, like we're not saying that that's right or wrong. It's like, that's how their body chooses to adjust to the movement in that moment, you know? So we're all not going to look cool like Norma, like one day, maybe I will, if I want to like just run all over the place, cool. But that's when I take up running. But right now, <laughs> I'm going to look like me. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, like, that's okay, too. So, yeah. And certain ideas still to this day don't translate well to me. You know? So, it's just like, okay, I can take it and appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not going to knock it either. But it, maybe when I hit the next level, level 20 on Lindy Hop, then maybe I'll get it, too. So, but just allowing yourself some grace, I think, is important, for sure. So you mentioned Norma, or what are what are some of the most influential people in your swing dance journey? Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So Norma's a beast. I think she's just like at the top, just because not only her dancing, but just her her perspective of the dance. You know, for her, just because she lived it, right? It's not a novelty to her when it's been your lived experience, and I think that's what I kind of got from hearing her talk. And I mean. Not I, I didn't have the pleasure of having a lot of conversations with her about the dance, but just like in a sense of when I hear her talk, it's it's just a sense of like her memories and her feelings and the joy from it versus like the technique from it or whatever. So those are things that I hold on to. I think contempt, like well, I'll stick to like legends. Like so Norma's one that I've looked up to when I was exposed to Don Hampton, like I didn't know who she was until years later. And by that point, Finally, when I was more aware of her, even a few years ago, she passed away. So I never had the pleasure of seeing her at an event. So, but just like even hearing her talk about the music, that's something that I identify with a little bit more. She's like, what is the music telling me to do versus like, or let me rephrase, it's encouraging me to understand more of, because again, coming from my dance background is like, your foot goes here and you do this and then your hand does this versus like, what does the music tell you to do? So it's like, oh, I can take those things that I know, but how does it influence the flow? So like, I think that's what I get from Don. Contemporary people that I like looking at and I think they're pretty when they dance. Let's see, Marie and Di is probably like top of my list because she embodies all those things that I just said. And I'm just like, who are you? And how are you here? And I like you a lot. And I also, what was it? I started looking right before COVID. I was looking at a lot of Jenna Applegarth stuff. Like, I think she's really cool and like how she adapts her dancing. Like, I think she's really smart and really cool. 
Jen, if you're out there listening, just know I have a dance crush on you. Don't tell anyone, but now you know. And But every time I see her dance with different people, there's different elements of her, but it's still her. And I think I appreciate that. Shisoma's really cool. Don't tell her. And because also, I mean, I, I tried a lot of looking at people who looked at like me, whether that meant ethnicity or even body types like Chisomo. And I've told her this before. It's a pleasure to see her on the floor, to see like someone like me dancing and kill it. And I'm not going to say anything else because I'm going to cry. So I'm going to move on. And then, and then when Nina was still dancing, like she was a big influence because she had hips and she knew how to use them. And she was not afraid to use them. Like Nina, for me, whenever I was starting to like watch videos of like cool pro people dance, like she was at the top of my list just because of her body type and stuff, just her curves. So I think that was the thing for me is to like, to imitate. I tried to look for people who looked like me in a sense. And it was cool versus like trying to imitate someone who was like a completely different body type. So I'm trying to use that, but I think those ladies are great. Naomi, her rhythms, I'm just like, who are you? And I just can't. But then, you know, she's a band leader now. I'm like, oh, I get it. Cool. She's just aware. So I think those are some of my top people for sure. And then my boss, like not to like, you know, ask for a raise or anything from Elaine, but back home we have Elaine Hewlett and she's just like the coolest in a sense of like how she adapts. She, she's, she doesn't look like any of the contemporaries when she dances. She just looks like a dancer, someone who embodies the music, someone who has fun with whatever partner or whomever she's dancing with. And I think like, that's something I look up to. And she's been on a personal level, like my biggest cheerleader. So I love watching my boss dance. And if you don't know who she is, she's that chick. Have you ever heard of, what was it? The swing Rueda. I don't know if you guys were around for the whole swing Rueda thing, but she's like, <laughs> she's almost like Bobby was, but yeah, like I love watching her dance just because she definitely embodies the spirit. So I think that's the thing. I don't know. I could keep just naming people on my history. If that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> this reminds, well, this reminds me of, this made me think that I wonder if something that will come back. So a large portion of the dancers have, probably oh, over the quarantine, maybe not been the most motivated to keep working on their dancing, which is totally fine. You have to do what you need to for your mental health. <laughs> I wonder if some of the dancers who have spent this time, they haven't had the constant events and the constant new stuff put on YouTube to kind of shape or kind of to, to kind of like push them in a direction of, of aesthetics or something. I don't know how much that might happen anyway, right. but I'm, I'm interested to know if, when we come back if individuality will be more out there because of the way people have developed or, you know, where their headspace has, has morphed and evolved over time. Because even if they haven't been practicing dancing, what they think about dancing has definitely evolved throughout the pandemic. You know, that I don't think you could stop that from happening. Right. Right. I think the first thing we'll have to do is say yes to what we have. Like, that's the lesson I have to learn is to say yes to me, <laughs> you know, in a sense, because I know, well, unfortunately for me, I haven't practiced. Have I taught a little over the pandemic? Sure. Have I like done my own practice? No, I haven't. And I think that's the thing is like, as we've kind of been experimenting, I'm calling this like all experimentations as we're opening, right? <laughs> we're kind of experimenting is like, gosh, just learning how to breathe again, you know, like that is just step one, like to get through this, like whether that's mask on, mask off, like getting our lungs awake, like that is like step one for me before I can even like consider what my body looks like. So it's just a matter of A, my lungs, but then two, I think the few, like the dances that I've done over the pandemic has encouraged me to listen a little bit more to my partner and to my own body which is really good. So versus trying to hit a thing all the time, I think it's provided space to, for me to, to have a conversation more and stuff, which is something I've been wanting to, that I was looking for even before the pandemic. And I think that's what my focus has been on, but man, when you're not able to do it, you know, for a long time, I think it's made my senses a little bit more awakened. So yeah, I'm curious to see what that looks like. Chisomo, what about you? Bobby, what about you? Have you <laughs> found anything like even with dances opening? I 
I was going to add on to what you said. I think that what I'm hoping for everybody, and I know I'm I'm going through a journey of this on my own because of I uh, some of my physical limitations have to do with uh, with some things that are going on inside my body. Like I I have some health challenges, and so over the course of the next few months, my body's literally going to be reconstructed in some ways, right? And so I love what you said about say yes to what you have because, and what I would hope people would do to extend that is to appreciate how how the new mechanics of how your body might work. Because I, I know a lot of people's bodies have changed over the course of COVID. We're not moving in the same ways. We're not going to as many events. We're, so the information that's coming to us is different. And then also our baseline, the way that we move is different. And so when we are going to be encountering movements we've done before, we're going to have to figure out how to do that in a different way, right? A friend who had a similar kind of situation to what I have talked to me about how she had, she's a dancer. She had to kind of redefine how her body moved within this new, you know, situation. And so, and often as women, our bodies are changing all the time anyway. Like if I know that women have had to redefine how they move after they've, they've been pregnant or like through the process of pregnancy or, you know, after birth. And so we essentially, it's like all of us are going through that process right now. We have to redefine what our, how our bodies are and be and extend loving kindness to ourselves through that. So those are my, my thoughts about that. Yeah. I think those are wonderful thoughts. I, yeah, I agree with everything y'all, y'all said. It's, it's for me, like coming back in. So I've, I've been doing a little bit of social dancing, been doing a little bit of teaching over the last few months. And it's definitely, on the one hand, my dancing has changed in ways that I'm very happy about that. Like there's kind of a, now that, you know, when you come back from COVID, when you come back from not dancing, when you come back from not putting your head in a really focused headspace, there's more freedom, there's more you let you, you I, I let myself just enjoy the emotional experience of it of like this thing that I missed having and now I get to have it again and so I was want to enjoy the emotions of that and then in in doing so you start to get really annoyed when your headspace starts to try to go back into its old ways of thinking like especially as like a leader who's trained a lot for contest or teaching classes you know like what's that move that I do should should I do something more exciting here? Should I do something that's impressive? As soon as my brain starts to try to push for that, I now get a little bit more annoyed because I'm like, no, don't take me out of this out of this peaceful place that I'm in, out of this like really emotionally experiential place that I'm in. And so I'm gonna I'm I'm still trying to keep fighting for that. And as I start to teach classes more and more, I have to stop myself from being like. I have to now design a move to, or, or a, a cl- I have to design a perfect class, which means I have to think a lot about the dancing and come up with a very specific focus and trying to like, even in my teaching, trying to like pull back from, you know, pull back from more planning, pull back from more like designing of, of class material and stuff. And it's weird, but it's, it's also a really exciting place to be. Yeah. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto to all the things. Yeah. I it's 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 an interesting time, but as weird as this like last year and a half, at least for me, has been, I it's been a blessing. It's like some self-discoveries for sure. Whether that's me as a dancer or as me as a person, like I'm definitely learning some new things about myself and learning some some like rooms for growth for sure. You know, and even if I'm not dancing right now, there's like, oh. I know what I think about this a little bit more. Like, you know, like there's been some, there's been some growing in that, which is cool. I hope that made sense. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I, Bobby, I have to say, I love what you said, just like adjusting your perspective. Like I just think that's really cool. Um, So next question. Yeah. Yeah. So Ursula, you've, studied a lot of dancing. You've had a lot of different instructors and teachers in your life. You are a teacher yourself. If you could infuse something new into swing dance teaching as we come back in, mm-hmm. what what would it be? 
That's a good question, Bobby. And back to you. I thought about this a little bit as far as maybe not so much on the teaching front, but like if I were to ever encourage like about performing and stuff, I, I think there were some interesting concepts like that I've learned about like focus and things like that. And what I mean by that, like literally where my eyes go, like this might sound, I'm, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible because it's honestly a simple answer, but something I've been aware of, like as I am trying to compete more, it's just like my focus and like what I pay attention to or what does focus mean? So like in, in our like movement analysis classes that we would take in school, we would talk about internal focus versus external focus. External focus, meaning like if I look at a spot in the room or if I look at a ligament or like when I turn, like the way I focus towards my foot might cause a different shape than like how I focus internally, which will create something different or convey something. And that's something like for me as a performer, I've been like more interested in. And it's, and like I said, I can be heady in my head about it, but I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. (laughs) But like my focus and if, when it comes to partner dancing, like my focus with my partner. And that's something like that I've tried the last couple of times that I competed versus like thinking I have, again, like I have to hit this thing. Like, okay, how do I focus on my partner? Like in that sense of external focus, like I choose to focus on their face. (laughs) Like it's something as simple as that, but like how that can, that, that is just as much communication as if touching them, you know, like, again, that magical word that we like to talk about is connection, you know, but I think something we could talk more about is connecting with our partners and like how we look at them. And I know that was talked a lot in our modern dance classes, specifically when it comes to improvisation, because that's the only thing you (laughs) kind of hope for is like, if I'm not touching them and they're on this side of the stage and I'm on on this side of the stage, like I'm looking at you and we got to make a decision in the middle of this dance score or whatever. So if it's not like something that's choreographed to the T and we have what we like to say a score or blueprint of something, like in order for us to do the next thing or to trust, like I'm about to run at you and you're about to lift me, there has to be some sort of focus. And I think that could be probably, I don't know, something to explore more as competitors or as we talk about competition, especially if you like, I don't have, a consistent partner that I compete with or I get to teach with. So I literally compete in draws. So that's my thing is like, I focus a lot on like connecting with my person in that moment, whether it's a prelim and I'm like, okay, I got you for like a minute, but I'm going to make the most of that minute. It's not about my agenda. It's about our agenda, (laughs) you know, to make this work. So, and I, and I think that was like the best compliment I ever got was at a prelim. There was this guy from, uh oh, China and couldn't speak English, but he had a friend interpret. He was like, that was like the best dance just because of our connection. I think that's rewarding. And I think we can find rewards even in competitions, <laughs> you know, whether you feel like, oh, I did great or not. Like the fact that I could connect with that person in that moment, like was the best thing. And I still have him on my phone. He's like, I had my friend record us dance because I we were doing the prelims, but I wanted you to see it, you know? And so that's what they were translating to me. And I was like, that's this, that's this dance. Like, yeah, we want to compete for a thing or whatever. For me, it was like, I want to compete so I can go to this other event for free. Cause I was broke. I'm still broke, but you know, like that's the thing. But if I can connect with people in the process, like that's what I think is important. And I think having conversations like that helps with, I think a lot of the conversations that we're having right now, like those missing links, you know, because we talk about it a lot in the art world, because, you know, we can get really philosophical about, oh, yeah, my connection and blah, blah, blah. And this relates to my world and stuff. I mean, we're kind of having those conversations already with this. But I think we can bring that a little bit into the classroom, you know, into the studios, into the ballrooms, just talking about what beyond touching each other and making each other do a thing. Like if I, you know, Morse code this, you can do this. Like, but like looking at each other, is enough, you know, being present with each other is enough. And I think we talk about that some, but I know I'm challenged to probably talk about that more once we're in person doing more classes. So that's, that's just a concept. I mean, I think that's the one I've been kind of chewing on mostly and hopefully that relates to someone. If it just relates to me, that's cool too. (laughs) I think that's great. That definitely, I mean, that definitely 
strikes a lot of thoughts in my head about, you know, about all of that and what that means in all these different levels. On a very simple level, I've done air steps with a lot of different partners over the years. And just, you know, when I started doing air steps with Jessica, my wife, she was like, by the way, would it be okay if you just looked at me before you chucked me? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I, I guess I don't look at you. Cause I guess I'm like, you know, like, focused on the, I'm focused on the feeling of it, but she was looking for a little bit of eye contact to like know that we're like in this together. And it makes a huge difference in like that feeling of like of of that connection and of 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 being ready to do this thing. And you know, like an air step is a risk, you know, an air step is is you is is you trusting each other a lot with your with your physical health in that moment. And, uh, you know, you can take that and apply it to everything, not just air steps that like a dance with another human being is in its own way, trusting yourself with another human being. And that eye contact is a great way to like, to, to be open to that and to show that you're open to that. Mm-hmm. And I like the check with the internal focus because I, I've been in classes and have gotten some coaching where people have said, okay, make sure that you're looking at your leader. And I know of, people who will try to get that eye contact like stephanie will sometimes blow on her partners to get it <laughs> she would <laughs> love it <laughs> so she's done that in competitions i've heard of other people like saying different words to like like yeah. people's attention but but i think having that conversation as you're talking about internal focus and external focus i know that like I know the thing to do. I'm like, I know I should look at my partner. I'm so inter- I'm so freaked out right now. I don't want anybody to look at me. And so you know, it's like, I. But being able to have that conversation, like, okay, where is your internal focus, and how is that impacting where you are and your ability to be present? Okay, so then, how can we adjust that? How can we maybe work on some mindfulness to then do this to so be present? You know, and so I love that, like the conversation of both parts. Yeah, because real talk, let's, okay, I'm gonna be real. Because uh, when I sometimes compete, like the few times that I've done it, sorry, notification, bye. Like, I know for me, whenever I've competed a little bit, like, that's been my check. A, it's vulnerable for me. It's super vulnerable and it's hard for me. And I'm like, I'm trying to practice what I preach. But then, two, it's like, like what you're kind of saying, Shisomo, like, you know, what Stephanie like to be like, are you, are we, do you see me? <laughs> like, do you see me in this moment? Because like, for me, like there are times, even in the middle of a competition, whether it's because of anxiety or nerves, like my body just exhausts itself, or I could just be like lack of stamina. Like that's the real part too. But even in those moments, like we can still have great dances but for me to be like, to communicate, I'm tired. Like, let's bring it down a little bit. Like it can still be in a fabulous dance and we can still do well. Cause that's how I felt when I competed at ILHC. <laughs> and I did a thing, I competed at ILHC. And like the partner that I had, I was just thankful. Like, I think he listened to me, especially during that, that last fall skate. Like everybody was doing these hardcore swing outs and I'm glad the camera was barely on me, but I'm like, dude, I, I can't swing out right now. Like the adrenaline is hit. I'm tired, you know, and stuff. And it was spotlight. Like we already danced, but then after, like, you know, the adrenaline of that. And then it's like, okay, we're doing this last all skate to like finalize who's going to do stuff, who's going to place, you know, is I think I appreciate Hussein for that just because he, I, I don't know if he's aware of it or not, but I felt like I was being listened to, like I'm having that eye contact and kind of like, even in my body being like, okay, I can't swing out right now. Like, Let's just do our best, you know, to continue. And I think those communications can happen on the floor. And because I rephrase, I think it happens a lot socially. But even in those moments of competitions, I know we want to give it our all, but it is a team effort. And I know we want we want to make gold, you know, but even Simone is like, I got to take a step back. Like those are those are important things for us to know, like, you know, for ourselves and for our partner's sake. And you can still do well. So but just like, like I said, that overall idea of focus and like how we communicate that and focus with our partner, focus in is really important because that's how the thing works. So, yeah, but yeah, I might try that. No, I'm not going to blow on anyone's ear, but I might. Maybe if I know them, be like, you there? <laughs> <laughs> definitely 
only been effective for her. It's gotten people they're like, oh yeah, oh you, you're we're dancing together. You are here, not it's just not just <laughs> Yeah. It's so. Well and there's by the way, I think that, that last thing that you ended on was is a perfect way to like wrap that bad boy up. I in in Bao, you know, you know, your partner's generally a lot closer to you. And so like making, you know, you have to tell people, you know, when you tell people, you know, you can look at your partner, you also have to tell them, but you know, you don't have to look at them all the time because that gets really creepy to like. <laughs> yeah. They can just get lipstick on their shirt, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then also but, in wow, that's the reason why like Stephanie could blow on these people because they're <laughs> cool, right? And it's so also weird to be like in pure bound be like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make it work in a swing out because I'm trying to learn this this Balboa and I'm trying to like get it down because it's a beautiful dance. I'm like, ooh, she feel good. She feel real good. So I'll be on that Balboa train even more post pandemic. Yeah, I'm not. I saw excellent, you were excellent. Well. You, like you were doing so well. You did. Oh my gosh. So while I was here in California, I just saw Jeremy Jeremy off. I was like, can you just dance for me for two seconds? I was like. I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, you're great. I was like, nah, fam. <laughs> we're trying. We're trying in these streets. So, <laughs> don't, don't ever doubt yourself with the Baboas. You're going to be, you're out here doing some great things already. So, yeah. I'm just, I'm just blessed. Like, I, I'm just constantly, oh, my cheeks are hurting because I'm smiling. But yeah, like, that's how encouraged I am. And genuinely, like, I think the people in these dances, in these streets, like, Overall, past all the talks that we're having and stuff, like I think it's encouraging to see these talks happen. It shows that we care. And that's why I think encourages me. Because like just a side note, sorry, notifications, but anyway, but I know for me, in a sense, like it gives me hope. And like I even told even Chisoma, like, okay, and just disclaimer, feel free to put this if this makes sense in the final edit or not. But I know for me as part of the growth about this dance for me and the culture is like this <laughs> sounds so weird out loud to other people but talking to some close friends it makes sense like this has been the most black aware i've ever been is because of learning swing dance like i've not been so aware of being black until i started this dance which is a blessing because i know i've had my own struggles about my color and like about my sense of like where i'm placed and stuff but overall, I think like this has been a really cool space to learn about my like about my own culture, about my heritage, about conversations, about like learning to talk about these things or whether it's like on a bigger platform, which I haven't done. But especially amongst friends and stuff like I think this has been a cool space to do it in, like in this community, because it involves <laughs> you know the people so I think that's been really cool to like experience all facets the art the people the culture and to talk about it like for me personally it's been really cool to to experience so I'm just constantly encouraged so well it's, it's lovely cool. to hear yeah it's been really cool yeah and no judgments in that like I think that's the biggest thing too is just like my space of just like you're reading white fragility. Cool. I am on the sidelines over here too, trying to figure out like wh where, where I've been in the sense of like how I've been seen on a global scale of just me as a black woman. So, and how I've seen myself and it's just been like cool to see, to grow in that. So, yeah. So again, you guys feel free to use that or not, but I mean, I think, I just think, that's how I'm just encouraged by the people, even through these hard conversations about bo even body type. Like, you know, like these are things that we're growing in and we're listening. And I think that's the first step is listening. So, yeah, it's interesting how like focused and intentional conversations brings greater awareness. And sometimes like there's sometimes discomfort with that as well, where it's like, okay, I mean, I knew these things about myself, but do we need to spend this much time talking about, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's like a little bit of that, but then there's also some freedom and being like, oh, oh, you see, you, you see it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, it's not, 
my body size isn't a secret or like my skin color isn't a secret that we're okay, cool. Like, and so, so the hope is that there are, there's more appreciation and more understanding of just existing, like how you exist in your life. Right. But one of the byproducts is this like, Oh, there's, there's more things for me to find out about myself. And yeah. Yeah. And then to normalize it too, because like, that's the thing for me is like, it's not a spectacle anymore. Cause like, that was like the biggest thing for me growing up as a dancer or trying to dance. Like I'm again, I'm not like that one size. My extensions weren't up to my ear and then over. Right. So it's like, but then I would watch certain things like programs look so you can you dance. And I remember there was this one dancer named Daniela and she was like the curvier black girl. And there's been other people who've auditioned who are the curvier dancer. And I'm just, I'm just ready for it to not be a spectacle anymore. Like seeing the judges cry and be like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> this, you know, shows like my biases and stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's something to realize. Now, what are we going to do with it? Like, that's, the, that's the question for me. It's like, okay, so now we know what are we going to do with it? And that's something I've had to ask myself. I know this information now, what do I do with it? So you guys are cool teachers. The conversations are good teachers, so I think it's exciting. <laughs> you, 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 you. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, as just like a thought, extra thought, whatever. You were, I. You're so kind, and I appreciate that you threw my name in that mixture of names. Like I'm kind of like I. You saw my face. I'm like, no. I. I was like, I was scratching my head. I wasn't trying to call any attention to myself. Like so, but. What I wanted to say, like you said that, and it reminded me of something I've shared with Bobby before about com- competing. Like my goal with competing very rarely is to win. It, my goal is to be seen so that more and more people can feel like it's a normal thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So I having, on the flip side of that, I do believe in practicing and being present in the space to the best of our abilities. I actually, found a video of myself a couple of years ago doing Balboa on a treadmill. Like, Bobby, this is the thing you do because you're not having a partner. I literally would dance on a treadmill. And I was like, I forgot this is how hardcore, how hardcore, how hardcore I was for a hot second in 2017. Yeah, there were just like videos of me on, there's a treadmill at home and I was like, and music in the background and I was like, doing all kinds of different variations, like sweeps and like stuff. That's awesome. Oh my God. And so <laughs> I have to remind myself that I'm also that person, but, yeah. but like, I, I think it's really important as you were mentioning for people to be, to be seen and to be represented and to feel a sense of connection in that. And, and the only way for us to do that is for us to do the things, right? 